Greetings from Martinsburg. Hello and welcome to the Skirmish Notes podcast powered by CivilWarTalk.com. I'm Mike and today we've got lots to talk about. This is our second podcast of the Skirmish Notes podcasts. Uh, I picked the name Skirmish Notes, uh, many of you may know, uh, because it's the name of a, um, a blog I was running for quite a long time. Uh, I used to do for uh, NSSA Skirmishing, uh, uh, like a weekly blog post uh, about different events that happen in the uh, North South Skirmish Association. And I haven't made a blog post uh, for that blog in like a year and a half or something along those lines. So that name has just been out there, unused. Um, my old articles are of course all still at that site, uh, skirmishnotes.com. Um, but it was an unused thing. Um, family has kind of gotten in the way of, of, of spending time composing blog posts and stuff like that. I've kind of felt guilty for not doing more blog posts as a as skirmish notes you know uh, um, a lot of the people in the NSSA knew uh, knew me very well from the blog posts uh, you know would follow the posts and, and meet me at skirmishes and say hey I read your blog and and uh, either agreed with you or disagreed with you those kinds of things uh, I had lots of supporters but I was a bit disappointed um, in myself in that I just couldn't seem to keep up with uh, making the weekly blog posts. It got kind of repetitive, um, like any sporting event. Um, even though the names of the people may change uh, as far as who wins and who loses of different events, um, it was, I was reporting the exact same thing every time we had a skirmish. Oh, a team won. Uh, and it became, at least to me, uh, boring to write about uh, because, because I was writing the same thing over and over again. Uh, so, so like I said, that went on, on hiatus. Um, it's been a year and a half since I've uh, made one of those posts, and I thought it would be a great idea um, to to repurpose that name, actually, to use for these podcasts. Now, if you watched our first podcast, it didn't really have a name. It was just a Civil War Talk podcast. Um, but uh, as of this podcast, we are officially renaming this blog uh, or video log uh, as uh, the Skirmish Notes podcast. Uh, now you can see I am playing Gettysburg, Scourge of War. Um, we are playing The Boys Got Their Dandrop. It's the very first Gettysburg scenario. Uh, it takes place um, virtually on July 1st, 1863 at 9.50 a.m. We're playing uh, Buford's Cavalry Division. Um, we're trying to defend McPherson's Ridge from the advancing Confederates, and uh, we're going to see how well we do here. I think I've got things uh, set up pretty well with my guys, so I'm going to just keep talking uh, while we play the game, and uh, you can go ahead and, of course, uh, see uh, what I'm up to as far as uh, the different skirmishing formations I uh, set up and seeing how I managed to actually flank uh, the Confederate units that I'm going to attack. Uh, we'll see what we can do here. It's going to take a little while to set this up and get engaged with, the, with these advancing units. Um, uh, at any rate, all right, so uh, different things I have to talk about today. Um, I've done an awful lot of things over the last three weeks uh, that I want to talk to you about. Um, I went to a skirmish in the NSSA, uh, known as the Veteran Skirmish. It's kind of an informal event. Um, it's really just like a, uh, a group of uh, veteran members. Uh, you have to be in the NSSA for uh, 10 years or more before, uh, you know, before you're allowed to attend one of these events. Um, so I went and I, I paid my uh, registration fee and went up there and shot the musket team match. It was a lot of fun. Um, I have some video I want to share with you after uh, we finish the game. This game will take about 40 minutes to play. Uh, but after the video, I'll share some video of the veteran skirmish. Um, if, if you remember from my first video, I said it's like a, a marksmanship competition with Civil War era uh, firearms, muskets, carbines, and things like that. This veteran skirmish... Um, it's all muskets all weekend long. Uh, we try to keep the format simple. Um, the vets are there to have lots of fun. And um, 
So we go ahead and uh, set up different breakable targets at 50 and 100 yards and set up some fun scenarios that uh, we don't normally do on a, a regular formal skirmish weekend. Um, it's usually it's the middle of July when we do this skirmish. It's usually pretty hot, so we don't enforce any uniform rules. So people show up in shorts and t-shirts. This is uh, you know one of our fun events uh, so that we can go ahead and not be so formal wearing uniforms and things like that. So anyway, at the end of the uh, end of this uh, uh, this game that we're going to be playing, um, I'll share that video with you. We'll see uh, exactly what what can be accomplished uh, as a team um, of eight guys shooting at breakable targets, or the, also the brigade skirmish. I have some video of um, where all the Union guys and all the Confederate guys get into separate lines, and uh, then we shoot at different breakable targets uh, as quick as we can. Knock down. A, we had a a beach theme, so they knocked down a surfboard and uh, broke a whole bunch of clay pigeons in the shape of a shark. It's pretty cool. So that's uh, one thing I wanted to talk about. Um, also wanted to talk about uh, my trip to the Cyclorama at uh, Gettysburg. I belong to the Gettysburg uh, Civil War Roundtable. Go up there every month. It's like uh, either the third or the fourth Thursday of each uh, each month that they meet. And during the summertime, we always try and do uh, three field trips. June, July, and August always is a, uh, those are all our field trip months. So we'll spend that time either at uh, the battlefield site um, or do a special trip like, uh, like we did last weekend, um, or last week. Uh, we went to, obviously, the Gettysburg Civil War Roundtable, which is at the Visitor Center. And I just said that really wrong, didn't I? It's the Gettysburg uh, Cyclorama at the Gettysburg Visitor Center. And uh, this is a special presentation. I think they normally call it um, uh, an evening with a painting. Uh, and we got to meet, uh, I think her name is Carol Reardon. She's the uh, expert um, who, who knows the Cyclorama painting uh, better than pretty much anyone else. Uh, she was there for the entire restoration move. Um, and, and the additional painting of the pieces that were restored. It was a, a very, very interesting uh, lecture that uh, we started with. We, we went to the visitor center. They had a lecture hall set up. Um, uh, Carol went and explained to us everything um, we'd want to know about the history of the painting, when it was painted. Uh, I think his name is Philip Poe or something like that. It's a French name. Uh, the guy who painted the painting uh, talked about his uh, painting experience, um, how many different Gettysburg paintings he painted. He painted four of these cycloramas. They are put in different parts of the country. Um, talked about how the, the Gettysburg cyclorama, the one that's currently there, was originally put in Boston, and uh, that it went from, from their cyclorama building in Boston to like a department store, and then it just kind of laid around in the back in their storage area. Supposedly it got rained on, and it got, uh, it was caught on fire, and some of the panels were burned and lost. Um, I also, uh, you know, read the, or, or, or it was told about the stories that uh, um, for, I guess it's the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg, they wanted to set a new cyclorama up in Gettysburg for the veterans, and uh, so it was like, uh, I forget what year it was. Uh, 1915 or something like that, I guess? Or 1913? 1913, I guess. Um, they set up the cyclorama, but it was, of course, missing pieces, so so they pieced it back together as best they could. Um, they kind of just draped uh, the different pieces of the painting. Um, uh, they didn't hang them in the normal way that they, uh, a cyclorama would be hung. Uh, of course, it was smaller than it was when it was originally designed because of the missing parts and pieces. And um, so, when when the cyclorama was rehung in the previous cyclorama, the one that that, that everybody complained about the building, um, that cyclorama was pieced together as best they could, but they didn't really piece it completely together the right way um, because it was missing complete panels and. And all that. So, so she talked about the whole restoration of the painting and how they added back uh, the missing pieces. 
um, using different methods and uh, photographs of the original paintings and uh, how they brought in a whole bunch of uh, specialists. I think uh, my game engagement has definitely uh, gotten into full swing here. Um, so it was, a, it was a very, very interesting uh, lecture. We got to actually go see the painting. Um, I had never actually seen the painting since it was moved from the old Cyclorama. I saw it uh, like 20 years ago when I was a Boy Scout. Um, we went, uh, I saw it in the old Cyclorama building. I thought it was very interesting then. Um, seeing it again now that it's restored, it's larger and there's more to it. Um, I can remember a lot of the bits and pieces of it, you know, in my memory. Um, the new, the new version is definitely worth seeing if you haven't seen it. And if you get to go see a night in the painting, you get to see um, information about the diorama that's around the painting. It, uh, they actually took us down to that second level, lower level. Um, you can look around and see exactly how they um, built the landscape and put all the props in place. And they explained to us uh, a lot of the details that you wouldn't normally realize were there. Um, like there's a well with a rope coming down from the well, but the well is painted on the canvas. The rope coming off of the well is a real rope, and it's actually attached to the canvas. Um, so things like that you may not notice um, under a normal screening of the, of the canvas. Um, you know, the interesting details that you'd never pick up otherwise. Um, we actually got to go down to the floor level where the painting is hung, uh, actually below the uh, landscape area, and uh, got to see the canvas up close. Actually, I actually had my, my nose within like an inch of the canvas, and you're we able to look up and see how the fabric is actually bent inward um, in a, uh, I guess, a concave uh, type of, of, of shape uh, creates a 3D effect so when you look at the painting it looks like like you can actually see off into the distance um, and, and see, so we were able to go ahead and actually see that curvature of the canvas which was pretty cool and we were also able to actually climb underneath the painting and see it from the backside which was uh, also interesting uh, they have weights strung all the way around the bottom of the painting uh, to help keep it taut so that it hangs properly and there's a big metal ring that those weights are hung off of and I guess they clamp the bottom of the canvas. Uh, we also learned also that the, the canvas that's hanging um, is actually two pieces of canvas. Uh, there is a brand new sheet of canvas that you know creates a, a full circular canvas um, that the whole cyclorama is hung on and then they took the original canvases which were either damaged or non-existent in some cases, but they, they hung what they had on top of uh, this new canvas so that it would kind of have a support structure and all the weight wouldn't be on the old 130-year-old uh, canvases. So so we got to see the, the new canvas and all the new paint work uh, done by the, uh, the artists. I guess it was now 12 years ago or so when they uh, first restored the painting. But uh, it's, it's very, very interesting to see. Um, you get to see all that type of detail is, a, is an amazing thing. So if you ever get the chance to go to Gettysburg and do A Night with a Painting, I definitely recommend it because it's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic experience. A great, great learning experience. I'm kind of getting lost here with my battle, but I think, I think I've got everything I can, can get. Um, so there's that. Um, the cyclorama trip was was fantastic. Uh, speaking of the cyclorama, though, uh, there's of course news from Atlanta um, that the cyclorama painting. Now, my understanding of this is a little bit sketchy because I've read articles saying that the cyclorama painting, which is owned by the city currently, is being sold. I think to a museum that's a few miles out of town um, and the, the museum's gonna actually build 
uh, a cyclorama center just like they have in Gettysburg and tr attempt to restore the painting in the same manner that they have at Gettysburg. So, so they'll hopefully be duplicating the experience uh, that you get at the cyclorama in Gettysburg. Um, but uh, there's a whole lot of questions that go along with that. Now, first of all, the people in Atlanta, well, I guess there's mixed mixed concerns about um, what's happening with the painting. Uh, some people think it's it's terrible that they move the painting out of the current building because they don't want to take the tourists away from that area. Um, also, a lot of people don't like the fact that the city is going to give up um, something that they might consider to be their property. So those are, uh, I guess, concerns that people have. Um, you know, the city giving up the painting to, I guess, a museum. I don't know, I have mixed feelings about if that's actually what's going to happen, having it happen. Uh, the city can't afford the painting, I mean, that's not really in question. Uh, I, my only question really, uh, my question really is, um, is there more, a more appropriate owner that can take care of it? Um, now, like the Park Service, the Park Service hasn't really shown the ability to take care of the Gettysburg Cyclorama. The Friends of Gettysburg, I believe, are the current uh, stewards or uh, keepers of the Cyclorama. Although I guess the painting itself is still technically the property of the Park Service. But, um, but the Friends of Gettysburg actually own the building that it's in, so it's kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, the Friends of Gettysburg have possession, but the uh, Park Service owns the painting. I don't know. I, I never really asked. I should have. I thought of it before I went in there to do the uh, night with the painting and uh, didn't think to ask that question. So, but anyway, I guess the question here is, is that, uh, is the public going to go ahead and have a better experience? And, and I guess you have to say yes, because uh, you know, having the painting restored to the way it should have been hung and displayed, um, giving it the full treatment that they have. Now, I've never seen the Cyclorama in Atlanta, in its, even in its current state, so, so I guess I shouldn't really say too much, because I don't know exactly what the plan is. I also heard that there's a uh, locomotive from the Great Locomotive Chase, um, that they'll be moving it into the building next to the cyclorama, which I guess is part of the current display by the city. So I guess the city is also selling the locomotive. I forget which locomotive it is offhand. So, but that, so that there's that. You can add that to the the mix of questions about um, you know, what's going to happen. So, uh, anyway, that's a current event thing. Definitely check out Civil War Talk. Uh, we've got discussions about the Atlanta cyclorama. I think it's definitely an interesting thing, and I'd like to know more uh, about what the plan is with the Cyclorama, and um, who's actually going to end up with ownership of it, who can profit from it. Are they going to actually have uh, showings of the painting for free, or do you have to pay a fee, or is it going to be just part of the existing museum fee structure, you know, however all that works. Uh, lots of questions that I have, because I don't know everything, obviously. But, um... It's something to think about, something to discuss, and uh, I think everybody will get a kick out of uh, having a completed cyclorama at the very least. I think that's good news that the cyclorama will be available for for anybody to go ahead and um, to see and um, enjoy it like you could the Gettysburg cyclorama. Um, an, an additional thing I did this summer. Now this has been this has been one of my busier summers, I think. Um, I've tried to do as much as I can with my family. Um, so one of the things I went and did, now my son, Adam, uh, son number one, he's uh, in, uh, in, in Cub Scouts. Uh, he just graduated from being a Tiger Scout to now being a Wolf Scout. And uh, I'm the, uh, the den leader for the den. And uh, the Scouts came up to me back in like April or May and said, hey, we'd like to do an Antietam trip. And they said, you know, uh, you have any ideas about doing Antietam? And I said, well, of course. You know, I live in Martinsburg, so we're uh, like 30 minutes away from Antietam. Um, so we had uh, some discussions about it, and I said, well, you know, if you need a, a tour guide, I can do, I can do the tour. I said, you know, we can always pay for a guide. I'd, I'd, I'd love to not do the tour too. 
but if you if you want to save the money and you want me to do it, I'd be happy to do it. Um, because I know if I do it, I'm going to do a lot of research and I'll learn from it. And if I went and a tour guide did it, well, I wouldn't have to have all that pressure, but at the same time, I could learn from the tour guide. So, so for me, I looked at it like it was a win-win situation. So, I have spent the last few months um, reviewing uh, Burnside's Bridge and Bloody Lane at Antietam, because those are the two main hikes that we wanted to do. And we spent quite a bit of time... Um, my family at least, uh, at Antietam, doing some of the hikes and stuff, getting prepared actually so that I'd, I'd know the field, I'd know all the little facts and figures that I wanted to have, and uh, be able to do a quality tour for all the boys. And we were going to have Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. Um, it turned out we actually ended up having about 12 boys total, uh, about half and half Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts. And so I didn't want to get, um, I didn't want to get too gory with the casualty details, because Antietam, of all places, is, is well, obviously the bloodiest battle in one day. Um, so, if, if I wanted to, I know I could spend all kinds of time about um, how many casualties there were, how many deaths, um, talk about the hospitals and the injuries, and it just didn't seem, it didn't seem like, to me, that it was a good idea with Cub Scouts. Now, Cub Scouts are are like seven-year-olds to like eleven-year-olds, and for seven-year-olds to eleven-year-olds, I just didn't want to play the part of you know uh, gore and uh, and death and and, and 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 all the casualties and stuff like that. It just didn't seem right. So I kind of tried to steer away from that. I I did talk about it from a military perspective, um, like with Burnside's Bridge. We talked about. Um, how the Union troops tried to advance on the bridge, um, and that the Confederates were defending the hill behind the bridge, and that you could almost picture the bridge and the and the hill almost like it was a castle with a drawbridge, um, and that that you know you were trying to attack this fortified position. We talked about the rifle pits. Um, we talked about why uh, the soldiers uh, could or couldn't cross the river, depending on depending on the situation, like that they attempted to cross the river in some places and they were just cut down, things like that. Um, I talked about how they were feeding regiments to the bridge, like one regiment at a time, and that really was probably not the best idea because it's so easy to pick the individual soldiers off from the, uh, from the heights above the bridge. So, so we did talk about uh, the battle, but like I said, um, with these boys, I was trying to keep things simple. Again, also, too, with, with oh, 7 to 11 year olds, yeah. they're not going to really grasp the history unless you use more general terms. So, I did the best I could, and I think I did pretty darn well. Um, I haven't actually talked to the scouts, so I don't have another meeting again until this coming Wednesday. But uh, when I do talk to them again, we'll see. Uh, see what they thought about my uh, tour. Hopefully they really enjoyed it and we'll do it again sometime, uh, if not Antietam somewhere else. Um, so, so I had a good, a good weekend there. Uh, got to see um, live artillery fire at Antietam. They had uh, some reenactors there doing uh, artillery demonstration, which I thought was great and the boys loved. Um, got to go to um, the bloody lane, and the kids went and uh, took the 79 steps up to the top of the tower. I believe that's what we figured out. There are 79 steps in the tower, which is also one of the questions in the uh, historic trails award for you know the Antietam portion. Uh, so, so if you if you need to know if you need to know that answer, I believe that was the correct answer with 79 steps. Um, then we went to uh, one of my favorite places, and we've gone here a few times this year. Um, we went to uh, there's an ice cream place in in Antietam, um, and I'm drawing a complete blank on the name of the ice cream place right now. I wasn't supposed to draw a blank on that. I was supposed to remember exactly what it was. But I, for some reason, I am not able to remember. I can picture the place in my mind. I can picture the, picture the sign. I can't remember what the name of the place is. But there's a really great uh, ice cream place when you, when you leave Burnside's Bridge and come out the exit road and go back into Sharpsburg. Um, 
right before you get back to that main road, um, you'll find uh, a little ice cream shop on the right hand side of the road. And it looks like a hole in the wall place, but if you go there in the afternoons or if it's a really hot day in the afternoon, um, you're just going to be, you know, a dozen people parked in front of the building and usually lined up outside as well. Um, they have really, really great ice cream. And uh, so, you know, we were going to bring the boys over there and, and have some ice cream because it's, it's also cheap. You know, it's, it's inexpensive and good ice cream. And you can't pass that up. So we did that and uh, also, went, uh, also went to Ferry Hill. I'd never done that before. Uh, Ferry Hill is part of the CNO Canal, which is right next to Antietam Battlefield. Uh, CNO Canal that runs along the Potomac River between Maryland and West Virginia. And uh, on the on the Maryland side, uh, and this uh, mansion house, which is named Ferry Hill, um, is uh, up on the heights just above the river on the Maryland side. And the Park Service owns it. It's part of the CNO Canal Park, which is also Park Service property. Um, and uh, the significant part of it is is that one of uh, Stonewall Jackson's aides. Um, his family owned that house. I think he even lived there. And um, so, so there's a story that goes along with um, uh, with him living in that house, the Civil War starting. I think he wanted to join the Confederate Army, and then there was some story about the bi bridge being burned so that they couldn't cross the river to go to West Virginia, and that made them mad. So then they they. I don't know, forded the river, I guess, and joined the Confederate Army anyway. Um, then I guess the family that continued to live in the house got... Um, I, I guess they got um, in trouble with the Union Army. You know, when the Union Army uh, established a foothold in the area, uh, I guess was trying also to do recruiting for the Union Army, uh, they got upset with the, the family for... Um, I guess having some southern, you know, uh, feelings <laughs> uh, that they were siding with the, with the southern cause. So, it was interesting to go to, but at the same time, it's, it's the kind of place where you go, oh, that didn't work out at all, uh, it's the kind of place where you go once, and you go, well, I've been there and I'm not sure I need to go again. They need more stuff up there. I mean, um, they have some historical stuff about the CNO Canal. Uh, there's even some models so that you can, like a hand crank model, where you can uh, see how the locks in the canal work so the boats can go up and down the canal. Which has got nothing to do with Ferry Hill, as far as I could tell. Ferry Hill is like a separate thing. Um, so, but, so they're using Ferry Hill as, as their uh, showcase for what's happening on CNO Canal. And there are some displays. Uh, about both the family, the house, the, the battle that raged in the area. Um, it, it, it was good, but it wasn't fantastic. Like, I, I'm not sure I have a need to go back anytime soon. I'll, I probably will at some point, but um, I was talking about showing Amy, my wife, um, the, the sight of the heights over the Potomac River. Um, I should look up over uh, Shepherdstown is kind of impressive, although uh, I guess, you know, the college and that Bavarian hotel that's across the way, um, it's impressive, but at the same time it's kind of like, well, it could have been so much more impressive if this wasn't so built up this way. Um, it was probably really, really beautiful in the 1860s, uh, but today Shepherdstown is built up uh, quite a bit by the college and the, the big hotel, which is okay. It just, uh, you know, it's 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 what it is. It's impressive, but at the same time, you know, darn, I wish it could be more impressive because because it has the potential to be so beautiful over there. So, uh, so that we did that, and um, we had well plenty of fun, and the boys learned a lot. I think about both the Battle of Gettysburg as well as um, as well as having fun hiking. You know. Uh, we were watching out for things like poison ivy. We were, we were talking about um, all the different farmers' crops that were in the fields, and we were talking about um, 
We're talking about the Muddy Rose. One of the things we discussed, we got to the Bloody Lane, or the Sunken Road, uh, depending on how, how, how you describe it. The Sunken Road has has become a point of interest, actually, to me, since we started this uh, adventure with the hiking and the Boy Scouts. Uh, the Sunken Road... Um, I have a theory which comes from Ed Bearers, although I, I kind of took what he said and then kind of spun it my own way, so I'm not really sure if, if what I'm saying is accurate. It kind of sounds like it is, though. It, it feels to me like the right thing. Anyway, so the, 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 the story goes that this is, this is actually a discussion for pre-battle Sunken Road. So it wasn't Bloody Lane yet. You know, it was just, just the sunken road. Now, Ed explained in one of his 150th anniversary tours that the sunken road is a little bit of a shortcut around the town of Sharpsburg, I guess leading up to, what is it, Ruhrsburg, I think is the name of it, is the town that's just north of uh, Sharpsburg. So, the, the, you know, the idea was that... Um, I guess if you're coming from the from the north and you want to head east, I think that the sunken road is your shortcut, so you can actually skip Sharpsburg. And and the way Ed explained it was that uh, the people of Sharpsburg liked that there was a shortcut for for the people that were just passing through town. That if they didn't have any business in town, uh, that they were happy to keep uh, all the horse traffic out of the town. And and well, you know, from a modern perspective, you go, well, why the heck would they want to do that? You know, if, if, if out of towners are coming through town, you want them to stop and spend money. But their their thoughts on this were a little different. They they were from of the thought process that if you're not going to stop in town, we don't want your horse making its messes in town because horses. Um, now, I know a little bit about horses, but, but very little compared to, I'd imagine, people who know horses. Um, but they make a big mess. They make, you know... <sighs> Alright, now we're going to be talking about something that, you know, it's a little bit disgusting. But the horses are peeing and pooping. It makes a big, stinky, nasty mess. And the people in town didn't like that. So the idea was that if you weren't going to stop in town, take the shortcut, skip Sharpsburg, and don't make the mess in town. You know, cause the, the horses don't wear diapers. You know, they just go. So, so anyway, this is what Ed's story was: is that this 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 shortcut allowed people to skip the town, and the townspeople liked it because they didn't have to clean up the mess. So that makes sense. But then comes the question: is well, why is it a sunken road? Is it a sunken road just because the ground is soft and all this traffic is going through there? Well, that 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 could be true and part of it. Um. It can't strictly be a problem of erosion because, well, then the whole hillside would have eroded. It wouldn't have just been that one spot where the road happens to be. Although there could be an argument that the, the wagon and horse traffic through there was softening up the surface dirt and then it was washing away. So, so there's that possibility. But there's also the second possibility. Now, the townspeople didn't want that mess. But what's the one type of person back then who actually might want that mess? Well, the farmers and their farmer, you know, the fields. You know, they're growing corn and wheat and all different kinds of things. And they want fertilizer. So, who's to say they weren't going to the spot where the sunken road was, because that's right by their fields, and just scraping up the loose dirt, which contains all those nutrients from all those horse droppings, and then spreading it on whatever portion of the field they wanted. Maybe they had, um, you know, crops that needed fertilizing, and they were stealing the surface dirt. And over the years of doing this, every year, if they were scraping out that section of road to, to, to scrape up fresh fertilizer for their fields, the, the road would get deeper and deeper and deeper until you're six or seven feet above what used to be the surface. So, so anyway, that's my theory on the sunken road and why it's a sunken road, is that the farmers were actually taking the dirt. So now I'm looking for someone who can come along and say, you know what, that's exactly why. Or, you know, you're totally wrong, because I'd like to know that too. But Ed, Ed made that explanation about, oh, how the sunken road is really a shortcut, and 
and that it was to keep the mess out of the town. And I just, my brain started spinning and going, well, if, if that's why, if that's why the townsfolk was, were sending the people over in this direction, why wouldn't the farmers take advantage of the, you know, mess? <laughs> so, well, that's my theory. Um, and, and again, it's just a theory. I'm not, uh, super educated. It's just one of those, uh, one of those uh, common sense type thoughts. And I, I've talked to a few people about it, but not very many, but a few people. The adults and the scouts all seem to think it was a logical thought. And I explained it to them pretty much the same way I just did with you. Um, that it's only a theory, but I'm interested to know if my theory has any, any weight to it. Because I'd actually like to know why, there are, why the sunken roads are sunken the way they are. Um, and if that makes logical sense. Because like, um, you never see a sunken road in the middle of a town, but those are the most heavily traveled roads. So, if the roads in town aren't sunken, but these farm lane roads are, why would that be? I don't know, it's just thinking it through, it seems logical that that must have been what was happening, is that they were scooping the dirt out off the road, and it just made the road deeper and deeper and deeper. I don't know. It's a thought. So, uh, here's my chance to tell you to go to Civil War Talk. And uh, when, you, when you find this podcast on CivilWarTalk.com, post your comments and tell me whether I'm right or if I'm wrong. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity. A um, few, uh, few other items I want to talk about today. Actually, this podcast is really being one of them. Um, I would love it if you'd visit YouTube. Uh, if you click on the little YouTube symbol in the um, in the lower right hand corner of this video, you'll see a little YouTube symbol. If uh, if when you're done watching the video, or even if you want to do it right now, which I'm fine with as well, if you click on that symbol, it will take you from well wherever you're viewing this video to YouTube, and then click like. That would be fantastic. Um, if you can also go to Civil War Talk and like the video or the thread that the video is in. Um, that'd be very good because I'm sure people would like to know that you like my video. But here's the most important thing I really would like is I'd like to have some people at least comment about whether they like this podcast. Do they like watching the video? Um, you know, the video of the, of the game, the Scourge of War, Gettysburg, uh, that we're playing. Um, feeling pretty confident about how the game has been going. So I'm hoping that, uh, but I get enough points. How do you know how many points you have, I wonder? Well, I guess I'm going to have to figure that out. Um, I don't see any place on here to tell you how many points you currently have. I'm still fairly new with this game, so I'm not totally sure. I'm assuming every time you manage to drive off an enemy force, um, capture enemy forces, that you're getting points somehow. I don't know if it's by casualty numbers or exactly what it is that they score based on. But I'm feeling pretty confident that, that things have worked out well so far. Um, I'm going to have to figure that out. So, uh, so anyway, um, so there's that. So please like, please comment. Um, if you use... Vi uh, uh, I can't speak straight today. Uh, but I guess... 40 minute battle will do that to you. Um, if you can subscribe um, to my YouTube channel, if you use YouTube a lot, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you don't use YouTube, I'm not super concerned about it. You don't have to subscribe. Um, but if, like, if you have a login name at YouTube and you frequently watch YouTube videos, a lot of people have the capability of subscribing to their favorite video makers. And I'm hoping that I will be one of your favorite video makers. So please subscribe to my channel. Like I said, this is a brand new thing. This podcast is only the second one that we're, uh, we're printing. Uh, I'm not afraid to tell you that there was actually a podcast in the middle between the first and the second one. We'll call it like the Lost Episode 1.5. Uh, but we're we're not gonna we're not gonna play that one. It was just a mess. So um, this episode here um, will be the second podcast in the series, and hopefully you're, you're enjoying it. And I think we're coming up 
on the end of our 40 minutes. So I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping I've done well enough. Uh, I'm going to have to probably read the instruction manual before I do my next scenario and make sure that I'm playing this game properly. On behalf um, of the members of the Heritage String but Band, things are going well uh, with the games, I think, at least. Jerry Westcott, uh, I'm also... I, now, I've been telling you, I, my McCrone, summer's been full. Banjo, I've been doing all Cody kinds of stuff. Um, I took my Taylor boys to guitar. watch uh, Monster Rio, Trucks the uh, earlier in the summer. Uh, I took my boys to Rodeo Amanda. on Friday night. Playing spoons, and boring, last and night, I'm recording this on Wish Sunday morning. Uh, Saturday night, I took my boys to a different... Now a different a uh, county fair to go to, well. you know, Stay the amusement well. rides. Well. And the kids rode and the amusement rides all America. night long. So, oh. and by the way, I'm probably rambling on a bit, but I'm a little bit tired, <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, but I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping, like I said, that this uh, video podcast series is a great success. Um, I'm going to get some rest and do the next podcast. Hopefully have it um, for either later in the week or... Or next weekend, one of the two. Um, I'd like to do these podcasts. I don't know exactly what I said in the first episode because it's been like two weeks, but I'm, I'm thinking right now along the scale of one podcast a week until I get more comfortable with it. And uh, if, if I do get comfortable with it, then I'm going to move to maybe doing it twice a week. Um, I would say that my goal might be three times a week, which is a lot. That's a lot of time to spend in front of the computer and then create the video and um, and then actually process it and send it to YouTube. Well, we'll see how we do. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that uh, I can make that happen. And if I'm successful and people actually you know think it's a, a fun thing, oh, uh, it's a defeat. It's a defeat by... Uh, I'm going to guess it's a defeat by one point. Otherwise, it would have been a draw. If I had gotten a thousand points, I bet I would have gotten a draw. Well, now that's disappointing. Um, that's disappointing. Well, I think it's time to show you, time to show you my, my other video, the video of the veteran skirmish. So hold on a moment, and we'll get that started. <laughs> 